So before we kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today. I'm here on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal of the people of the Aurora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. So I'm so happy to have Graeme Begg with us today. So Graeme has over 30 years of experience in the mining and minerals exploration sector. And since 2002, he has spearheaded collaborative research aimed at scientific multidisciplinary ma mapping of the architecture and geodynamic evolution of the continental lithospheric mantle and crust. The outputs contribute towards the commercial global lithospheric architecture mapping products, also known as GLAM, and it's aimed at facilitating a breakthrough in Greenfield's exploration discovery. And I can't wait to hear some of Graham's knowledge today as he discusses with us mineral systems in context, dynamic processes and a 4D earth. It is going to be an awesome session. I hope you all enjoy it. Please keep using the chat. We'll be opening up the floor for discussion at the end. And yes, thank you so, so much, Graham, for joining. It's amazing having you. Thanks, Jess, that's, that's, that's great. Um, really, thanks a lot for the inv invitation. I've been watching GeoHug grow from this fledgling idea, I guess, into this huge thing. And it's, been, it's a fantastic repository of information and, and it's fun too, which is excellent. So what I'm going to share with people today is, is really focused more on the larger scale of, of mineral systems and how they operate and why they operate, uh, where they do. Um, it's, I, I guess, when you operate at this scale, you start to see the earth as this fantastically uh, amazing, moving, organized thing that spits out supercontinents and ore deposits as a consequence of its sort of ever, ever moving, its, its quest to, to lose heat to space. Um, and you can't help but be in awe, really, of, of the earth. And whilst we've come a long way, uh, you still, you know that uh, we, we've just uh, just started to scratch the surface of, our, of really understanding it. So the first couple of hundred, uh, oh, and by the way, there was a reasonable amount of this presentation was given uh, recently, but there are, there are some differences for those who happen to see uh, that other talk. Um, the last couple of hundred years, you know, earth science has emerged and it was really, it'd been, it's been a downward looking science, you know, dominated by outcrop scale observations. And so all deposits were discovered by, by prospecting and, and, and luck. Uh, the 50s to 70s saw a, a shift. Um, the, the plate tectonic revolution uh, came along and explorers could suddenly put ore deposits into a predictive context, which was really powerful in terms of their exploration. The 70s and 90s saw a whole suite of new geochemical and geophysical tools uh, at, at a variety of scales, and it greatly improved our understanding of the deposits uh, and their crustal context. And since then, the 90s to 2020s, we've, we've now gained the ability to, to see the whole earth, to image lithosphere scale, to uh, we've got there a new geochemical and geochronological uh, tools and methods. Uh, we have GIS to play all, with all our data in, and uh, there's this fantastic processing capability that we, we certainly never had before. So suddenly we can actually, it's, it's feasible to map the earth in four dimensions um, from the core mineral boundary outwards. So in terms of ore deposits, our focus is now on mineral systems that form them, and the, the focus has shifted outwards to the lithosphere scale, um, and the link to the global geodynamic system. The system that's always, you know, doing really one thing and that's losing heat to space. And that's why the earth works the way it does. Um, so if a couple of examples, I guess, of, of mineral uh, systems uh, frozen in time. Uh, if we have a, a plume impact here uh, at, under, under our thick continental mantle uh, route, uh, the, the plume will flow to areas of thinner lithosphere, which is mostly going to be towards craton uh, margins. And uh, it can readily decompress. Uh, that decompression, sorry, means that it will readily melt and those melts will be injected up the big structures at that position. So hence this, 
this relationship between Creton margins and uh, the sort of mafic intrusion related uh, nickel copper PGE deposits. On the right hand side, we've got a relatively shallow dipping subducting slab. And because of that shallow dip, it's pushing on the, uh, the front of the continent here that causes compression and crustal thickening. And if that's strong enough, then the arc melts themselves get trapped in deep magma chambers down near the Moho, where they can fractionate and become very water rich. And that's the precursor to our big porphyry copper moly deposits. Um, whereas towards uh, the back arcs are a great environment to have low degree partial melting, just little bits of melting in the mantle. And we've learned that that's a great way to move gold around and bring it into this metasomatized area or altered area of the continental roots. It can be stored there for a long time and eventually be harvested by subsequent events and form our gold deposits. The things that these systems uh, uh, share are they, they're all connected to the upper crust by transatmospheric faults that provide that focus and connection. Um, geodynamic drivers actually prepare these systems and, and the ore emplacement itself generally follows some sort of tectonic switch, some sort of stress switch that, uh, that brings in the highest grade, the best material into these deposits. So if we're going to have this perspective of the whole lithosphere, then we really do need to map the whole lithosphere. And this is something that really wasn't happening. Um, our group 20 years ago decided we had to make it happen. And so we embarked on a, on a mission to map the continental mantle, the crust, the whole interconnected thing in not just three dimensions, but four dimensions. And that has been an enormous uh, learning curve uh, and continues to be a learning curve. To this day. And so we're really, I guess, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify the, the individual blocks. What we've discovered is that the continental mantle is actually segmented and that you can identify and map these boundaries um, in, in a variety of data types, some with direct detection and some by proxy. Um, and that we can by using the crust as a proxy, as well as information from the mantle, we've learned to interpret a lot of the signals in data and uh, we can ascribe a history to each of these blocks. So we want to know what's happened through, uh, to each block through time. How did they join their neighbors? What was the mechanism that brought them together or maybe rifted them apart and then brought them together a second time? Um, and what's the overall connection and evolution of all of these blocks coming together and potentially dispersing through supercontinent cycle. And eventually we want to know which structures in the crust are going to be best connected to these sorts of features so that we can go and look more effectively for large ore deposits. Because there's one thing that all major ore deposits have in common and it, that is that it takes a lot of energy to form them. And something needs to drive that energy and the best place to get that energy from is heat from the mantle, uh, let alone direct magmas and exolved fluids. So our mapping in, uh, is focused at, uh, we make a crustal uh, layer uh, called crustal elements. They're a bit like terrains, but smaller. There's about 6,000, uh, a bit more than that uh, globally of them so far. And they're all um, classified by their composition and age and tectonic setting. Um, and, and their history is characterized in review, literature reviews. Um, this next layer is, is what we call upper lithospheric domains or ULDs. Uh, they're below the crust and they're nominally at about an 80 to 100 kilometer uh, depth slice. So to do this, what we're trying to do is combine all geoscience data. To, to solve the riddle of all of the data that's available to us and to use any new data set uh, if, if it is going to help. So in terms of geology, there's, there's a lot of different, you know, huge amount of information. And of course, published literature is massive. And then there's geophysics, lots of geophysics. And of course, geochemistry at a variety of scales, some of it being quite 
uh, fundamental research, understanding things at the micro scale and other elements of it being quite a large regional macro scale. This, is, this nice bit of work by Teal and Heinsen uh, shows a couple of these translithospheric faults across the western edge of the Gawler Craton. You've got the magnetics in the plan view and you can see in the mag that the big strike slip uh, fault zones, Talakutra and Karabi. And of course, these big strike slip faults have to be sub-vertical. I mean, there's no way that you can trans translate 200 kilometer thick uh, lithosphere without them being very steep. And seismic reflection doesn't see those structures directly. So in a lot of cases, they are missed in those, those profiles. However, MT can image them very nicely. You can see this nice conductive feature coming vertically here, another one coming very steeply there. So we need to cross correlate between um, data types when we're doing any interpretation. It must be multidisciplinary. Otherwise there's a real definite risk that you're going to miss the most important things. Um, so if, if you're looking in a profile view of a continent, we would see these blocks of continental mantle crust over the top and these big structures. And what we know is that it's these big, big boundaries that focus the vast majority of the world's great ore deposits. Whether you're looking at the Norilsks of the world or, or the porphyry coppers in the Andes or, or, or the gold in the Yulgarn um, uh, or Olympic Dam, wherever it is, the biggest deposits are close to these structures in the connected network of structural secondary, uh, of crustal secondary features. So first let's look at the context of all this in a supercontinent cycle. How does that work? And what we've identified is that we're pretty comfortable with an 800 million year periodicity uh, of the supercontinent cycle and that it is a first order control on what mineral systems happen and when. So uh, just to first uh, um, show you some of the evidence for whole mantle convection, which you require to have a supercontinent cycle, and uh, what we see here is a seismic velocity image where the red color, red white color is the high velocity. And that's going to be the cold at this sort of depth, that will be the cold subducted slabs um, from subduction. And the depth we're looking at here, we're about 1000 to 2000 kilometers depth. So this is the middle of the mantle. It's, it's 3000 kilometers to the core mantle boundary or almost. And what you can see here is that uh, uh, under North America, this is the Farallon slab and it's beautifully imaged. You can follow it down to where Central America used to be. I mean, to get to this depth uh, requires between 50 to 150 million years to sink this far. So on average, about 100 million years. Um, and 100 million years ago, this was where the West Coast of the US was. But of course, the US has kept moving. So the West Coast of the US is what now way over here. Um, and you can see this jog through where Central America was and of course the South American slab here. And these are from uh, subduction that predated the Africa-Europe uh, collision and predates the uh, India-Asia collision. And emerging, uh, we're seeing the tops of these very low velocity dark blue areas. Uh, as we go deeper, uh, you'll see them uh, in, a, in, a, in a little while. The other balance to all this is what comes up. And that's uh, things like mantle plumes are an important component of this. And uh, there was a lot of dispute about their existence uh, in recent uh, times, actually, uh, probably up until the last probably five years or so when it's really been put to bed, um, where uh, the much higher resolution data now clearly shows the hot, and, and this color scheme is the opposite to the previous one. So this time the red things are the slow, hot, uh, rising plumes. So you can see the Pitcairn plume beautifully, the Samoa. Over here, you can even see the three fingers up to, up to Samoa, Tahiti and the Marquesas, um, McDonald Island and, and, and Cape Verde down here. So if we looked at a, a sort of a synopsis, a summary cartoon of how that all might occur and roughly several hundred million years into a new supercontinent cycle, which is where we are today actually, uh, post the peak of Pangaea and it's now broken up, um, the continents are dispersed. And what we have is a big upflow zone. There are two of them uh, on the planet, uh, roughly uh, 
180 degrees apart and, and the continents are moving around because subduction rolls back and uh, the continent follows along and you're gradually dropping bits of subductive slab down towards the core mantle boundary where it starts to accumulate. And what we observe is that after about 400 million years, all of the uh, continents uh, end up, or the majority of the continents end up clustered on one hemisphere and you get a number of oceans that open and close. And so you have another 400 million years or so of subduction that's dominantly on one hemisphere. So that means that eventually you blanket the core mantle boundary with the subducted material whilst you're building your supercontinent. And you end up in this situation where your supercontinent is directly above this blanketed material. Now we know that it takes about 200 million years for these slabs to thermally equilibrate with the lower mantle. So little bits of those slabs become uh, 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 thermally buoyant, thermally and chemically buoyant. And so they start to be unstable at the core mantle boundary and this triggers mantle plumes. And so you are basically effectively burning off uh, this uh, slab graveyard from the core mantle boundary. And of course, peripheral subduction on the edge of the supercontinent, which I've, I've elected not to show in this case, um, is going to contribute and reinforce that flow so that now we have downwards flow out external to the supercontinent and we have upwards flow under the supercontinent. That creates a, uh, a super swell or dynamic topography and plate tectonics really has one job and that is to minimize potential gravitational energy at the surface of the planet. And so it says, all right, let's split the supercontinent up and move these buoyant continents away from this, this bulging bit of the planet. So there we go, off we go and we kickstart our new, new cycle. So what does it look like today? This is an image of the velocity of the core mantle boundary. It's, uh, it's back in our color scheme where the, the slow velocity is the blue stuff on the core mantle boundary. That's very slow. That's where all the hot stuff is. So seismic waves go slower in hot mantle. Um, and this is where Pangaea was, right in the middle here. Um, uh, Africa is partly above it still. Everyone else has cleared out and, and, and gone westwards or eastwards, et cetera. And what you also see is that um, the, dot, the triangles and stars, these are the positions of hotspots today that are active at the surface. And most of them are clustered over either this low velocity, which was where Pangaea was, or this low velocity, which is in the Pacific Ocean. And that's where the Rodinia supercontinent was. So when Rodinia broke up, it formed this upflow zone and low velocity zone and it created the Pacific Basin as we know it today. If we reconstruct the position of all the um, uh, mantle, uh, large igneous provinces of the last uh, 300 million years. So these are the things that are really big and quite a few of them are extinction events um, and a number of them for, for more deposits. And what we have here is, um, uh, a couple that are outside, but the majority of them are clearly right where the supercontinent was. They've come up under the supercontinent, they've created the upflow zone, and then the supercontinent has dispersed. And the ore deposits that formed in the process uh, 250 million years ago, we formed the world's greatest nickel copper PGE deposit, that's Norilsk, associated with this Siberian traps, and Skaregard uh, formed 55 million years ago, and down here in Siswa, which is a, a much smaller nickel copper deposit about 180 uh, million years ago, associated with the uh, Karoo lid. So we've looked at mantle plumes and, and supercontinent cycles. Let's focus in a little bit more on the continents. But before we do, um, let's summarize that, that uh, the impact of that supercontinent cycle on the the nickel copper deposits down the bottom and the PGE rich deposits at the top. And time is on the bottom axis and size on the vertical axis. And the supercontinent peaks, the time of greatest, I, I, I call the peak of a supercontinent, 
the period of greatest collisions, the really big orogenic collisions between the biggest blocks. It's not necessarily the end of the process because supercontinents are kind of ephemeral. They, they come together, then they disperse. And there's only a brief period of time where most of the supercontinent is together. Uh, and what you can see, Kanoa land, Nuna, Rodinia and Pangaea. Each one has an accretion or amalgamation period when it's building and a breakup period that goes then into the next amalgamation period and peak and breakup period pretty seamlessly. And what you observe is that the majority of the big deposits don't just form around the peak, but actually they form mostly at the start of the peak, just leading into the peak. And this is the period when you've got the most aggressive tectonics. So there's a correlation of these deposits with big collisions, aggressive tectonics, and the emergence of these mantle plumes, big plumes coming up uh, from the core mantle boundary beneath your growing supercontinent. Notice there's hardly any significant deposits towards the end of a supercontinent cycle. Jinshuang would be the main standout of exception. Looking at um, uh, the settings of these deposits, and this is summarizing the most sort of significant deposits through time, um, oldest at the bottom. Uh, and this column here is, is the, are they associated with a large igneous province? And you can see that overwhelmingly, really, it, it, it's, it's yes. So there are distinct large igneous provinces which can be mapped and detected as part of your exploration tool. Um, the next column is looking at the relationship to craton margins. And what we can see is that uh, they're either near a craton margin or they're right on the craton margin. And uh, that, is, that applies to virtually all deposits. The next column to the right uh, tells you what is the setting of these deposits relative to the continent or supercontinent. And the majority of them are intracontinental. Some of them are associated with intracontinental rifts or marginal rifts, but many of those rifts are actually either in the act of closing or actually closed by the time you get the mineralization. A simple illustration, <clears throat> illustration of the relationship of the uh, nickel deposits to craton margins, and these ones around the edge of the uh, the Superior Province uh, and, and the Nain Province, they're all different ages. Uh, the, these guys, these two are the same, uh, 1.88, but the others are different ages. Um, it just shows you that those margins are really great uh, focal points for mantle uh, melting. And injection, of course, into the crust. This bit of geochemistry, which is uh, rhenium versus osmium here, um, uh, and osmium, osmium versus rhenium osmium. Uh, the, the purpose of showing this is to illustrate that the large, from a very quite small restricted subset of large igneous provinces, what we've discovered by looking at the freshest material, most primitive material in these large igneous provinces is that the ones that have got ore deposits in them show evidence that's these colored ones. These ones over here don't have ore deposits in them that we know of. And it seems to be a bit of a fertility indicator. And what it's indicating is that you're picking up old osmium out of the continental mantle. And there are other characteristics of these guys that are quite distinctive that indicate that these plumes are the ones that are interacting the most with the continental roots. Now, that doesn't mean they pick up any nickel and copper out of those roots necessarily, but they, because those are in abundance in the plume melt anyway, but they may pick up a bit of PGE uh, uh, along the path, which could be a contributing factor to that budget. But the other thing is, it's possibly also just a process indicator that the tightest settings, the most, the settings that force the plume melts to focus are going to be the ones that where we get the ore deposits. And that, that tight setting will also ensure that the plume melts are more likely to interact with their wall rocks and be contaminated. So either way, it's a good thing. Pete Lightfoot put together a nice diagram of what happens when these uh, nickel forming uh, uh, systems uh, come into the 
the mid to upper crust and uh, illustrates a, a deeper magma chamber where you're, you're reaching sulfide saturations through interaction with wall rocks and um, or sulfur saturation through interaction with wall rocks and various other factors. And eventually uh, massive sulfides build up and, and are injected during pulses into these net, this network of, of pipe-like intrusions, these, these chonloth uh, type dikes. Um, and then you have gravitational settling of the, of the uh, sulfides within uh, areas where the, um, the melt slows down and uh, they accumulate. Some of these pipe-like chonloths uh, on the right-hand side are really nice illustration of the Babel Nebo chonloth um, with multiple pulses of magma injection. And, and on the right, the huge uh, chonloths at Norilsk, uh, over 20 kilometers long, the Talnark intrusion. The, the massive sulfide accumulations are shown uh, in, in uh, red. And they're a symptom of really organized fluid flow and extremely um, uh, you know, strong uh, pulsing fluid flow. And pipe-like geometries are typical of the encompassing envelope of many ore systems actually, uh, whether or not vertically or horizontally. With respect to these nickel copper PG systems, uh, ge geodynamics can really swing, swing you from having a, a system that is uh, barren uh, to a system that can produce um, uh, ore deposit. And so if you switch from extension to compression, this is a really good thing. So you can go from unproductive to productive system. And the, the best example of this, a clear example is the Nova deposit on the edge of the Yilgarn Craton in Western Australia, where this image from Spagiari et al shows the Yilgarn Craton, the southeastern edge, is the Albany Fraser origin on the Craton margin. But there's this feature out here. This is the Nornla microcontinent. And during the Mesoproterozoic, subduction was established along this uh, margin here, dipping up towards the Yulgarn. And that subduction being relatively steep, pulled this microcontinent away from the Yulgarn, opening up a failed back arc rift, you know, a narrow marginal basin. Into that basin poured the products of a plume melting. So we had plume impact under the Yulgarn, flowing to the edge and into that, uh, that rifted zone in, in the back arc. Now there's no significant mineralization early in that process, but everything that's good happens once the South Australian craton comes along, labeled here as the Madura block, <clears throat> terminates the subduction by collision with the Nornalup microcontinent. It pushes that microcontinent back up against the Yulgarn, which of course inverts this basin. And that is what forms the Albany Fraser orogeny. That process means that the plume melts have to become very focused. They have to fight their way through the lithosphere, which means they have to be very organized. And all of these things are great for forming big ore deposits. And we find right at the end of that collision, as it switches from strong compression to relaxation, that's when the, the chonoliths inject at Nova into the deep to mid crust and with their massive sulfide load. So these deposits don't necessarily have to form in the upper crust is, is another lesson uh, from Nova. Some other examples of the, you know, the role of regional gene dynamics, I guess. Um, on the left here, we've got the Siberian Craton and during the um, Siberian traps, large igneous province, a number of units were erupting uh, right across this huge region here uh, under a regime of northeast southwest regional shortening. But suddenly, because of events that were happening down here in the closure of the Central Asian Orogenic Belt, the stress, switch, the stress system switched to a much more easterly to southeasterly, um, uh, northwesterly directed shortening direction. And we see that the that um, changed the uh, unit that was erupting uh, near where Nurilsk forms. And there's a magmatic disconformity in effect. 
you, you switch to a new, uh, quite different unit, and you in, at the same time, you inject uh, the chonoliths at the basement contact full of their, their stored up load of, of magmatic sulfides. On the right hand side, top right, is, is the example of Boise's Bay on the edge of the Nain Craton. Really nice work by Dawn Evans Lambswood and, uh, and Pete Lightfoot. Um, and during the Nain uh, igneous, large igneous province, uh, the plume impact associated with that, the shortening direction is, is almost certainly has been parallel to that Craton boundary. So something like it's shown by this arrow here. Um, which would favour that boundary for the injection of those plume melts. And they've injected right at the intersection with this large cross-cutting translithospheric fault, the Garda fault zone. Then um, a little while later, during the injection of all of that, and we see the switch to a much more easterly, uh, east-west type uh, shortening direction, such that the Garda fracture zone initiates as a dextral shear zone. And immediately that, that happens, you get injection of the chonoliths and the massive sulfides. So it's evidence that these, the processes that are forming the massive sulfides are probably operating over a period of time, building up the massive sulfides, and then they're injected when you get one of these major stress switches. And we think we're seeing a similar thing down here in the West Musgraves uh, in Western Australia where it looks like there's been a stress switch from easterly, uh, east-west to sort of more of a northeast, uh, southwest at the time of mineralization. Just emphasizing um, the role of the, uh, the, the setting, the overall setting with respect to the continent. These are all of our, the giant deposits globally and their settings are overwhelmingly intracontinental. Um, the ones that are small marginal basins, the definition of those marginal basins means that you have a microcontinent just outboard, just like we just saw with the non light microcontinent being just outboard of the Yulgarn with that small uh, basin where the Albany Fraser uh, formed, um, then these were all similar to that. So they were protected by this outboard uh, uh, microcontinent. So if we summarize those deposits, um, we need active translithospheric faults. We need uh, regional aggressive tectonics and the peak of the supercontinent as you're coming into that is fantastic. Okay. The faults have to be active for the melts to be able to enter the, the crust. Um, if you have compressive conditions, it is better for focusing the melt. And that seems to give you uh, consistently a better outcome. In the low MGO systems, these sort of mafic uh, intrusion related systems, we've, we're seeing evidence of tectonic stress switches being really important, uh, triggering the final injection of, of accumulated massive sulfides. And you don't want to be near a major ocean boundary or near an active subduction zone, because that major ocean boundary means you're going to, A, probably have poor focus for, for, and a lack of compression perhaps, uh, to form a deposit, and B, it'll be prone to destruction during the next collision, continental collision. And subduction can interfere with the plume upflow, so you don't seem to get great focus. And you want to be able to preserve your deposit, of course. So paleocraton margins adjacent to thick lithosphere generally are key in internal to your coalescing continent, supercontinent, are the most favorable for all of those to occur. We switch uh, now to look at uh, some other deposit types, uh, porphyry coppers and, and gold in particular. And I'm going to introduce the Laux process and the fume process. The Laux process is, uh, I described earlier that when you have a compressional arc, you thicken the crust and you trap the melts deep near the moho. And what Bob did was he, he, was the, he was the person who really described in detail this process. And this is what I'm referring to. Um, this process that actually occurs in these magma chambers, the fractionation, 
the buildup of the water content to above 10 weight percent water in these chambers and that suppresses the plagioclase um, um, crystallization. So you end up with lots of strontium in your residual melt and it promotes the water rich melt, promotes the uh, horn blend and magnetite uh, 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 to crystallize. So that traps the yttrium. So you end up with these melts, these residual melts that are high in strontium, low in yttrium. And that's the symptom of, a, of what we call an adekite, an adekitic magma. When they escape, that very water rich nature of the melt means that the fluid will escape deep and the partition coefficient is accentuated uh, hundreds of times so that you take something that's only 20 to 40 ppm copper and you create something that can be up towards 1% 1, 1 uh, copper in the ore forming uh, fluid. The fume process, fertile upper mantle extraction, uh, is really about moving gold around and storing it and then removing it again. But we'll come to that next. First of all, let's just focus on evidence for this process. And the Andes is a great spot to look at. And again, Bob's uh, work, looking at the strontium yttrium uh, behavior through time. This is 90 million years ago to the present day in the central Andes. And these are pro this is effectively a proxy for the amount of water buildup, which we know is a proxy for the compression. And geologically, we know the late Cretaceous to Paleocene is a period of compression in the Andes. It builds up to a climax of high water content, and then it relaxes. The, the, ore, the, the, the fractionated melts escape and the fluids escape that, and you get ore deposits, big porphyry copper mollies. It happens again during the Eocene up to a climax, and then you get a relaxation in the late Eocene and the, the, the magma escapes upwards, releases its fluid, and you get a bunch of supergiant deposits. And now it's doing it again through the Oligocene, Miocene, and you're getting more supergiants in, in the Andes, include, including El Teniente and Los Bronces. Where is this lo likely to happen? It's most likely to be a continental margin arc margin, because they're the margins where you can sustain shortening for the long periods of time to build up this very water rich melt, this, this Laux process. So island arcs tend not to be able to accommodate um, compression for as long because you tend to initiate a new subduction zone somewhere. So these are some of the examples where in the last 200 million years, you've had a really uh, suitable environment uh, for these style of super giant deposits. Switching now to the fume process, so low degree partial melting in the mantle has shown that you can get incongruent melting of the mantle sulfides, which means that you can separate the precious metals. So the, the, the gold and PGEs, the tellurium and some copper will, will escape with a small melt increment and they will be frozen or trapped in this, uh, these structural zones of, 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 of um, metasomatized continental mantle. And they tend to be, uh, the metals are in the veinlets within those metasomatized zones. And then later on, if you have some sort of decompression event due to movement on this fault uh, or a thermal event as well, then that can trigger the melting of these things because they have the lowest melting point of any material uh, in the vicinity. And that will generate a metal rich alkaline melt that uh, it can then, and volatile rich, and that can then travel up into the uh, crust. So this is the example from Brent McInnes's PhD, uh, just a brilliant example of a mantle xenolith that's altered. It's encased in fresh, glassy, alkaline, uh, basaltic uh, glass that's, uh, that's come up just near the giant 80 million ounce uh, Lahir gold deposit. This has erupted onto the seafloor, bringing this mantle xenolith. There's basically little to no metal in the altered mantle xenolith out here. The metal is all in this veinlet, uh, the gold and the copper in this veinlet uh, of pyroxenes and phlogopite, magnetite and some sulfides. And so if you have trillions of tons of this material in your source region in the metasomatized mantle, then if you get a triggering event that, that uh, induces melting, these things are going to be the first thing to melt. So you will selectively melt out uh, this veinlet 
And so you're upgrading your metal content right from the get go. And if that happens, some of these um, in, you know, melts, um, they'll tend to be quite alkaline and often lamproferic. Some of them will come through to the upper crust and we'll be able to see them. Uh, and they're quite often, these uh, synucleotides plus uh, uh, lamprophires are quite often uh, seen around the world associated with the timing of gold deposits spatially and temporally. And this example from Andrew Choi's work on the Yilgarn uh, shows really nicely that the gold content of the 2.64 calcalkyl and lamprophires in the Yilgarn is extremely contaminated with gold. So they're coming up the same conduits, they're sampling this, the, these veinlets as well, and uh, they're a symptom of this process. Similarly, in the Cretaceous, we had an episode uh, in North China of very aggressive flat dipping subduction, strong compression throughout the Jurassic, and you come into the, the mid Cretaceous and suddenly that, that gets turned off and it switches to extension. And as soon as it does, the, the magmas can escape upwards from the Laux like magma chambers, but also that, that decompression associated with that extension induces the melting of the veinlets in the mantle, the fume process. And so they can come up in and you get one of the world's great provinces of gold rich deposits, uh, which is Eastern China, now the world's uh, highest producer of gold annually. Um, and uh, what we see is that some basalts that were uh, melting of the mantle, these basalts erupted at the same time as these deposits were forming. And these basalts are shown here uh, as extremely enriched in gold. Whereas basalts that formed from just melting the convecting mantle without the participation of these veinlets have very little gold, less than a PPB generally. Uh, and that's the examples of those there. So spatially, we would expect these zones of metasomatism in the mantle to be lower velocity areas. And of course, they're gonna be areas generally with lots of structure that, that taps from the mantle to, to the crust. So the, this image of the superior uh, craton at a depth of about um, close to 200 uh, kilometers, uh, high velocity, this red color of the northern part of the root of the superior, and you can see the contours of the velocity are shown, but all the neoarchean gold deposits are clustered around the edges because that's where the big translucent faults are, that's where the metasomatized mantle is, and um, you can even see the Abitibi belt, which is in a bit of a trough that goes across here, slightly lower velocity trough uh, through that area right there. So really tapped into a nice zone of lowered velocity because metasomatism of the mantle uh, and that developing that source region in the mantle actually means that that mantle has a lower velocity. An example of our mapping, um, this is from outside Australia. Uh, you can see the scale at the top. This is at a depth of about 130 kilometers. Uh, this, this seismic image, we've got a high velocity block. Uh, it's very old. Uh, we think it's almost certainly Archean in age, um, but it's caught up on the, uh, in a microcontinental ribbon here, part of a ribbon microcontinent with a young arc over the top of it. And the, uh, this ribbon gets pulled away from the craton, opening up a back arc basin along here. And so subduction was dipping to the north under this block. Then subduction was terminated. It jumped into this northern ocean, into that back arc and dipped south under this block. So this block had nice low degree partial melting in, uh, associated with, with some of this arc activity and particularly towards the back arc. But along these big structures would be very uh, lower velocity, as you can see, good spots for metasomatizing the mantle. And of course, along this collisional margin, you're going to get nice reactivation um, afterwards. And this is where the gold deposits are. There's a giant gold deposit here, a major right beside it, another major here, and a giant here, and another major here. Now I should reiterate that our mapping of these boundaries is done uh, using direct methods and indirect methods and proxies. So we use gravity and magnetics and geology 
seismic tomography, um, magnetotelurics, you name it, um, as well as everything we can get about how the crust is deforming and behaving as well. If we switch to looking at some magnetotellurics, uh, this is from the Auslam pro program, which is rolling out across the continent and the South Australian survey were, were, the, were really quick off the mark and they've been leaders in this MT area for a long time. And um, uh, what we're seeing is this massive conductor. And this is at a depth of about 50, you know, around 50, 55 kilometers depth. So it's just below the crust. And it rims around a former paleocraton boundary around the Gawler Craton in South Australia. And you can see the gold rich IOCG and gold deposits uh, are on the edges of it. Challenger, Prominent Hill, Olympic Dam, Oak Dam, Carapatina. Um, and in fact, the famous Olympic Dam cross section and coincident uh, seismic reflection is northeast trending section across here. And in that cross section, you will see this anomaly just below the crust. Uh, when we switch to it here, that's this anomaly. From the work with the seismic reflection and geology and other data along strike, we're able to determine that this is a former collisional boundary that's been reactivated at the time of plume impact. Those hot plume melts come up into here and they melt some of these areas of metasomatized uh, mantle, lots of uh, ultramafic lampropheric melts come into the crust as, as long, uh, along with other plume melts and you get this huge 40 kilometre wide zone of interaction and then finally we get these pipes that are coming up to our giant deposits like Werderwell and Olympic Dam for example. A very nice bit of multidisciplinary work came out of China last year, uh, published early last year um, by Lu et al. And um, it goes across the, this series of sections across the southeastern edge of the North China Craton, uh, where you go across the lower Yangtze metallogenic belt of porphyry, copper, gold, and, and scarn deposits. And what we see here in the seismic reflection, this is the Craton margin effectively here. This is North China Craton. You can see the reflectors, the, the the symmetrical arrangement of the dips of those things and the offset of the moho here. And you could infer that there's going to be a steep structure in here that you just can't see. And these authors have actually uh, put that structure in. And of course, at the surface is the giant, this huge fault zone, the Jiangyang fault zone, which is a major regional uh, fault in Eastern China. So it almost certainly is a major transatlantic uh, feature. And the deposits are along that, that structure and just adjacent to it on second order features. In the magnetotellurics, you can see a conductor that's coming up out of the mantle and into the crustal network of features and is then those fluids and melts are then available uh, as potential ore forming uh, agents. This is a, a map that we published uh, in 2013. It's using the US array uh, very detailed, the world's most detailed uh, grid of, of so passive seismic. Um, it's an image at 90 kilometers depth, uh, P wave velocity image. And I want you to first, uh, and I plotted the big deposits and a little bit of architecture. And what I want you to notice first is that there's a lot of blue over in the West. That means that it's slower velocity overall. And that's because the Western US is very hot. There are high geotherms, that slows down the seismic waves. Whereas if you come to the eastern part of the diagram, the colors are much more yellow, red, and green. And that's because the lithosphere is cooler here. And so all of the waves are traveling faster. So you've got to allow for this. What we're most interested in is mapping structure. So it's all about the heterogeneity in the velocity signal. So over on the east here, it's this green zone on the edge of the high velocity Archean route of the Wyoming Craton right on along the edge, right next to the Trans-Hudson origin zone, we have this low velocity corridor. There's your paleoproterozoic giant gold deposit in Homestake. Most of this is undercover and poorly explored. Further south, as we come into Colorado, there are uh, a couple of paleoproterozoic shear zones uh, here, 
uh, that become uh, reactivated in the uh, Cenozoic, giving triggering uh, these giant uh, molybdenum and gold deposits in the Colorado uh, mineral belt. And the Jemez lineament is a, is a former suture zone that gets reactivated. And right on this uh, intersection with this Proterozoic feature, uh, you've got uh, several giant deposits in Arizona of copper uh, moly porphyries. Over in the west, you've got the supergiant Bingham Canyon deposit on a triple junction of, of lithospheric blocks. And you can see here where the velocity is slower, this dark blue, this big structure, uh, slow velocity up this corridor, really fundamental structure. And the Carlin trend deposits are on second order features to that, that formed in the Neoproterozoic, those features that were reactivated in the Eocene when you develop those, those ore deposits. And here we have the mother load trend along this low velocity corridor in um, California. So you're seeing a very direct relationship between mantle structure, lower velocity and ore deposits in this diagram. And to, to sort of wrap up, I guess, I, I want to move to the dynamics uh, a bit more. And so fertile geodynamic scenarios are, are where either they're the favorable uh, tectonic situations, geodynamic situations, where either the Laux process or the fume process in the context of those previous deposits uh, are triggered. Um, and uh, uh, John Ronsky and I have basically uh, agreed on this sort of uh, uh, classification where type one is when you have at a regional scale, you've got very strong compression for, for building. Now that's great for the Laux process. You're gonna trap the, mad, the the arc melts deep in that magma chamber, which is going to become very hydrous. So that's fantastic for building up copper fertility. For gold fertility, um, it can trigger the fume process uh, and the melting of those metasomatized veinlets, particularly on structures that are at a high angle to that strongly compressional arc. So think Octeti, uh, think Polgara, uh, those sorts of, or, or, or even Murantau as the districts that are at high angle to compressive um, margins. When you transition, transition to, to extension or transition to strike slip, then it allows uh, in the context of these Laux type uh, chambers, then those magmas can escape. And so you often find the best mineralizing period for the copper moly period uh, deposits will be right up that transition, which releases those those stored magmas there that are ready to partition their copper content. Um, and over here, of course, that, uh, that action can relate, result in decompression melting uh, in the mantle source region, the metasomatized mantle. It's fantastic for gold deposits in strike slip fault zones, et cetera, um, and uh, uh, incipient extensional zones. If you don't have the sustained compression, but you purely have strike slip, then you never build up the Laux type process in the deep crust. So you might just get a small amount, but you won't get a really good deposit. So you, 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 you won't see a big copper moly deposit, but you will see gold because it, you can trigger uh, the melting of those metasomatized veinlets uh, and uh, bring, bring that material into the crust. Plume impact is an interesting extra way of, of uh, as long as there's active tectonics of triggering um, the gold things. It's not relevant for the porphyry coppers, um, although it does form IOCG deposits. Uh, and of course, um, it forms uh, gold deposits in places like the Desiato Massif in uh, Patagonia and uh, the Winnemucca district, including the sleeper deposit uh, in the Western US when the Yellowstone plume impacts uh, at that time. And of course, Palabora and Olympic Dam are great examples of IOCG systems formed by plume impact. So to summarize that spatially, you've got a convergent margin, for instance, uh, where it's strongly uh, orthogonal convergence and, and aggressive convergence in this case, uh, then strong shortening in this area is going to favor trapping of the arc melts uh, in the deep chambers, building up that Laux process 
uh, so that eventually you might release uh, that and get your big copper molly porphyries. The gold deposits that you find at this age are most, or this position, are most likely to be on high angle structures like Pulgra, Octeti, etc. Or you might blend the Laux process chamber with the tapping of the, the fume process. And so you get a copper gold uh, porphyry uh, like Grassberg. Um, whereas where the margin is slightly more oblique slip, uh, less compression, you're more likely to see perhaps copper gold porphyries, lower copper grades, or just gold only deposits. And think of the Canadian Cordillera uh, for that sort of situation uh, as a good example. And of course, in Central Asia, where you get a lot of deposits during the strike slip phase along these sorts of structures um, uh, and under that strike slip regime. We can actually go a step further now and, and put all of this into the context of the governing um, uh, movements of the continental fragments and the, the setting on the scale of, of microcontinents and continents. Uh, our work would indicate that at the time of the Archean deposits in the Superior, that the margin of the Superior was actually at least as far south as the Southern Pinocchian block. So if that is the case, then if there was a arc, if there was an arc, um, then you would expect it to be way down here and to have been completely overprinted by Proterozoic processes, several episodes of Proterozoic processes, and of course, young cover. So we don't see the Archean arcs, but the gold deposits are way back here in the intracontinental intracratonic back arc. And all of the Southern Abitibi has been pulled apart much more effectively than the Northern Abitibi. So this is where the gold deposits are in the back arc where the low degree partial melting processes are much more effective uh, relative to that subducting environment. Similarly, just a very basic cartoon uh, for the Yulgarn craton, you can imagine that if there was subduction um, out to the east, it really needs to be well out to the east, which puts the um, sort of, uh, you know, Ida fault along the edge of the western Yulgarn really over, over a thousand kilometres behind your subduction zone. You're not going to see arc melts back here. You're going to see lots of uh, uh, other mantle melts and a whole, a little bit of an arc flavour occasionally, perhaps you know, uh, from being in that back arc setting. Uh, early on with rollback of subduction and extension, and then as that sort of triggers to neutral, we have uh, a plume impact. We get a lot of nickel forming in the commodietic uh, units when they contaminate with the sulfitic sediments at surface. Um, uh, and uh, that's a, a giant province of nickel deposits. And then we get start to get the collisions, which are typical of a supercontinent peak where we get this strong shortening that inverts those greenstone belts, and then you get a bit of relaxation, decompression melting. You're going to get uh, some gold deposits uh, in this process of this aggressive tectonics. And then the next period, of, and late basins, of course, forming during that post collisional extension. And then you hit it again with the next uh, microcontinent coming in, and that's going to force these structures to become strike slip and that's perfect for orogenic gold. And the next collision will do the same thing until the whole thing just seizes up. And it's a symptom of, of the peak of a supercontinent. We can actually put a similar scenario together, but much more effectively for the Nuna supercontinent. So if we take some of the fragments that we can join together for Nuna, including West Africa, um, which is full of paleoproterozoic gold, and of course the Guiana Shield, and the Karajas, and, and, and down here in the San Francisco, um, the Congo. Now Florida belongs with all of this uh, and Southern Texas and the Gulf and Yucatan. They're all part of this, uh, the Gondwanan fragments. And we would add also these fragments of Baltica, which um, are generally thought to be uh, near neighbors. And it does fit with all of our data um, if we go back uh, a couple of billion years ago. So looking at those pieces, uh, here we've got a number of arcs and microcontinental ribbons. And this ribbon down the bottom is the San Francisco rock. 
the Borborema and Nigeria. This one here is, is uh, the, the Guaprori or Karajas region, um, and it's perfectly a long strike and with the same arc rocks as we see in Cote d'Ivoire. And so the Ghanaian um, uh, and Burkina Faso greenstone belts are effectively in the back arc here. Look at the scale, here's 1400 kilometers. Um, up here, we've got uh, the Guiana Shield uh, greenstone belts. Notice that they're parallel, but way to the subduction zone, but they're way into the back arc, well over a thousand kilometers. And similarly, here's the man block and the greenstone belts of Guinea uh, over here. Now, the first collision we see um, is along this margin where these, these two microcontinents collide at 1.4, sorry, um, 2.2140, thereabouts, 2140 MA. And um, uh, that terminates the subduction here. Uh, the granitoids all sort of uh, die off here, but the arc action continues over in this part of West Africa, over in uh, Senegal and uh, in the West. And then we have the next big collision, which terminates that causes Northwest Southeast shortening. And this time you get a lot of strike slip on some of these and activate these uh, shear zones which gives you a bunch of orogenic gold deposits. And then the next collision is with the Eastern Regabat and the Hogar. They collide around 2.06. Um, and that previous collision was about 2.09, 2.08, 2.09. This one's about 2.07, 2.06 uh, collision. And that causes Northeast Southwest shortening and reactivates these structures, gives you the second wave of orogenic gold deposits in West Africa and in the Guiana Shield. So to conclude, ore deposits are produced by mineral systems. They're lithosphere scale, and they're linked to this global geodynamic system. That's supercontinent cycles. It involves mantle uh, convection and, and, and plate tectonics. The geodynamics preps these mineral systems, gets them ready for, mineral, for, the, for the key period of mineralization. And the lithospheric architecture will determine where this is going to happen. And ultimately, it's generally a stress switch that triggers the emplacement of the ores. I'll leave it there, thank you.